So since I'm entering the last two months of my residence at the BSA, and since something tells me they won't let me near a microphone again, I would like to begin by thanking Professor Morgan for securing the funds from the British Academy for the Adriatic Connections Research Programme, which you heard everything about now, but I will just add. <laughs> my project on the cult of the Virgin in the early medieval Adriatic is sponsored by this initiative, and I will present the findings at a conference I'm helping organise at the British School in Rome in January. But today, I will talk only about some parts of my postdoc, while the main focus will be the issue of what is considered Byzantine or not in Croatian art history. This topic is the result of a new interest I have developed over the last year. Two things have contributed to this. On the one hand, I am dealing with the issue, um, with this issue as a participant in a research seminar framing medieval Mediterranean art, which is hosted by the American Academy in Rome. The aim of that one is to examine how and why the Mediterranean countries, including Croatia, Greece, Cyprus, Italy and others, use medieval archaeology and art history for the purposes of nation building. On the other hand, it dovetails with the ideas I started having while attending the Balkan Futures workshops here at the BSA, which examine how Balkan perceptions of the region have changed since the fall of communism. I'm assuming that many of you are not familiar with early medieval art and architecture from Croatia. The country is small and the language is difficult. At the same time, any broader analysis of the Adriatic as a region can be complete without taking into account the material and visual culture from its literal. Being a borderland between the East and West, the East Adriatic coast produced a uniquely hybrid visual culture which brought together Byzantine iconography and Latin epigraphy, but also small domed churches and basilicas. This was a mosaic of societies marked by local differences as well as cultural openness and interaction. But mosaics and hybridity do not make strong national symbols and grand narratives. With this in mind, tonight I would like to discuss the following. Firstly, the problem of terminology, but just briefly that one, so basically what is Dalmatia, what is Croatia? Secondly, what was and is considered Byzantine in the visual culture of early medieval Dalmatia? Have there been any shifts, especially since the breakup of Yugoslavia? And thirdly, I would like to show you a couple of examples which illustrate the trouble with Byzantium and what is at stake when calling a work of art Byzantine. To address the problem of terminology, we need to start with maps. So, modern-day Croatia and Dalmatia do not correspond to the medieval uh, realities. Let's see. Oh, yeah, there we go. So, Dalmatia today is called, the, it's the literal part, uh, li literal <laughs> part of Croatia, whereas um, that was only applied to a couple of cities there. Croatia today is named for the whole country, whereas originally it was just one of these um, Slavic principalities which settled in the Roman province um, of Dalmatia. And the other ones were, you can see them there, Principality of Neretva, Zahumje, Travunia and Duklia. So these were other Slavic principalities with their own rulers uh, and so on. So Dalmatian towns and early Dalmatia uh, had a very polit specific political meanings and these towns um, kind of survived the arrival of the Slavs in the 7th century and as such fell under the authority of Byzantium. So north to south they are... Uh, Kirk, I'm, having, I'm giving you the Italian names in the brackets just in case if you pick up books which are yeah, from Italy or even early 19th century books uh, that are written in English will have the Italian names rather than Croatian. So Kirk, Rab, Osor, Zadar, Trogir, Split and uh, Dubrovnik. Uh, following the fall of Ravenna and the associated exarchate in 751, Byzantium eventually organized this town into a theme, a military unit with a governor called Strategos, who was responsible directly to the emperor. This occurred at some point between 810 and 821, and Zadar was chosen as its uh, seat. Um, so I'm just showing you uh, lead seals that named the Strategos of Dalmatia, and I'm showing you the only Greek um, inscription found in Croatia and Dalmatia, which was found in Zadar. Published only once, never again discussed. <laughs> um, as the fortune of Byzantium changed in the 10th century with the Bulgar threat and in the 11th with the Turks, 
So did its control of Dalmatia. Venice began to loom large as a new power in the Adriatic and, being a Byzantine ally, started to see itself as a Byzantine proxy when it came to who had the last words in Dalmatian town. In the 11th century in particular, these towns were the subject of a power game between Venice, Croatia, Hungary and Byzantium, and the first to lose control over them was Byzantium. By then, the old theme of Dalmatia was long gone, having been broken up in two by the Narentani in the 890s. The southern half, however, was put together in a new theme with the Strategos at Dubrovnik. The Norman presence in Apulia and their attacks on Duras and Corfu um, in the 11th century did not help, and neither did the expansion of Slavic principalities, which had become kingdoms, most notably Croatia here, and then Dukla, which gradually uh, got Zakhne and Travunia, so there were two big neighbors there. A symbol of the waning of Byzantine control over Dalmatia can be found in the chrysobul of Emperor Alexios I, with which he granted trading privileges for Venetian merchants and the title of Imperial Proto Sevastos to the Doge Domenico Silvio, and soon after that, in Alexios's confirmation of Doge Vitale Falier's jurisdiction over Dalmatia in the 1090s. Now, the reason why I have started with the terminology is that it matters a great deal. Medieval principalities of Zakunia and Travunia are interpreted as Serbia today, as Serbian medieval lands, on the basis of primary sources such as Constantine Porphyrogenitus's De Administrando Imperio or 11th century papal letters to the archbishops of Dubrovnik, which state that the archbishop's diocese covers the kingdom of Zakunia, Sorbulia, and Travunia. Serbia and Zakunia would roughly correspond to present day Herzegovina, medieval ones, I mean and southern part of Croatia, while Dukla covered the territory of modern-day Montenegro. The factitious pairing of early medieval and modern terms was painfully felt during the war and breakup of Yugoslavia, when the excuse for a seven-month siege of Dubrovnik by the Serb-controlled Yugoslav army in 1991 was the claim that it has historically never been in Croatia and would be prevented from staying in the newly established republic. Next. I would like to highlight the trouble with Byzantium in the art historical um, discourse. If we look at the members of the International Association of Byzantine Studies, we find Chile and China, but not Croatia. There is no society for Byzantine studies in Croatia, and there is not a single Byzantinist employed in a Croatian university. I'm not a Byzantinist either, so we know that. That is not to say that Croatian scholars showed no interest in Byzantium in the early days, quite the opposite. In 1711, um, Mattia Anselmo Banduri, a Benedictine monk from Dubrovnik, published at Paris, Constantine Porphyrogenitus's De Administrando Imperio, based on Johannes Meursius's first edition and the earliest surviving copy of the manuscript from the late 11th century. By the second half of the 19th century, which is the time when early medieval monuments begin to attract scholarly attention, because before that it was just about antiquity, antiquity, we need to find Roman stuff, and this is ugly and awful. Um, so then they start to uh, attract the attention of scholars. The term Byzantine, and especially Italo-Byzantine, was used arbitrarily to, des to describe any domed church and a large number of relief sculpture. Until 1930, when Ljubo Karaman published his book on early medieval art and architecture, a large number of foreign scholars, such as Eitelberger, Jackson, Hauser, and Erar, and even Croatian ones, such as Rachke and Jelic, interpreted Dalmatian churches as displaying Byzantine influence on the basis of their centrally plain, planned designs, they're very small, just to mention the scale, vaults, and uh, the use of domes, all of which were regarded as uniquely Byzantine features. At the same time, Italian scholars tended to think otherwise. According to Ugo Monere de Villar, ground plans and forms were Byzantine, but they were introduced in Dalmatia by itinerant master builders from Italy. And he said that there is nothing Byzantine in Dalmatian art, or creation for that matter, which he saw as emerging from the Latin foundation and therefore as Italian. And I'm giving you just a couple of examples of these sculptures and what Dudan says in 1920, where he looks at these and he says that there's nothing, that, that there is the hand, the barbaric hand that reduced all the Latin grace to monstrosity. 
So that is that drive to want classical things and only Roman things, and this is just, this is just awful. And I think when you have to understand why the weight of historiography presses on these things, is that Croatian scholars or whatever would respond to that at that time. So you would have the uh, formation of a narrative in the 1930s, which goes against this, basically, uh, which is a colonial attitude. Um, right. Now, with regard to early medieval sculpture, it was considered synonymous with interlaced decoration and explained either as a result of the work of Byzantine carvers who came to Italy or as being connected to the production of the Lombards. Karaman himself uh, supported the latter hypothesis um, and argued that in Byzantine art, interlaced ornaments were not as popular as vegetal motifs. In contrast to that, when offering his explanation of Dalmatian architectural types, which he saw as emerging, uh, sorry, uh, he argued that the aforementioned vaulted churches were the result of the ingenuity of local builders. What he and others after him continued to consider as Byzantine was a number of specific monuments, such as a chancel screen from the church of St. Mary at Biscupia, another gable from the church of St. Michael on the island of Kolce, just off Dubrovnik, and a marble icon from Rao. The first two were interpreted as local works, so this one and this one, and the third one is still considered uh, to be an icon which is imported, and I think they think that probably because the material used is marble, which you don't find often in early medieval Dalmatia. You get uh, good quality limestone, but not marble. Another aspect of the visual culture in Dalmatia, which has been considered Byzantine, was iconography, or to be more precise, certain iconographic schemes. These mostly coincided with 11th century figural sculpture from Zadar, such as the chancel screen panels depicting the Nativity of Christ from the churches of Holy Dominica and St. Lawrence, while other examples um, on the same chancel screens included a combination of Western and Eastern motifs, and at the same time the Annunciation with the Standing Virgin was called Byzantine, um, the greeting of Mary and Elizabeth as well, you have it here on this one too. So basically it's analyzing it, oh, because it's this, it has to be Byzantine because the, in Byzantine art is the first time where you get these things. When it comes to architecture, despite Karaman's view that early medieval architecture in Dalmatia was purely vernacular and expressed through churches of variegated shapes, from the 1980s to date, scholars such as Tomislav Marasovic and Igor Fiskovic have claimed that the following types of churches draw on Byzantine models. So basically, as you can see, is that the architectural typology is really big in Croatia and it doesn't go beyond that. So what they want and what they do is they put the types together and then they kind of put them in groups and interpret the groups. So two have been singled out as being under the uh, Byzantine influence. Firstly, the so-called South Dalmatian dome type, which includes churches of small dimensions with three bays and a little dome above the central bay. Um, and these are found in the territory from Split to Dubrovnik. So this is the one from Kolochev, which had the gable of St. Michael, I will return to it. And this is the one from a place called Omish, which is just close to Split. This one is completely preserved, so this is what they would have looked like, more or less. The second group is consists of the 11th century basilicas of the so-called Byzantine type. These are regarded as opposed to longitudinal early Romanesque basilicas connected to the reformed Benedictine monasteries. Egos and Jurkovic argue that these basilicas are based on local traditions. So there's one in Solin, two again in Zadar, which are the churches that have those narrative chancel screens. Basically they say it's because the side aisles are very narrow, they think that there could have been a dome above the central bay, although that's not proved, neither in this case, where this one's preserved as well, but not the dome. And the most interesting one is St. Lawrence at Zada, which you can see the interior here. And these are the aisles, you can't actually walk through them. They're only like 60 centimeters uh, wide. And the second one is the Church of St. Nicholas in the Velivarsh area of Split, which um, has four columns and the dome, which is in a tower, rests, um, rests on, on the cross. 
simultaneously. So while they say all this is basically displaying Byzantine influence, all this, simultaneously they say that the largest and the most important early medie medieval church in Dalmatia, the rotunda of the Holy Trinity, now called St. Donatus at Zadar, has been uh, brought into connection with a short-lived Carolingian presence in the Adriatic at the turn of the 9th century, even though during the same century a Byzantine strategos resided in the town, as is known from the sources and also from the lead seals that I showed you. The art historical argument for the Western influence is purely formal, so again, the typology and morphology again. It relies on the perceived similarity with Charlemagne's rotunda in Aachen, but historians such as Mladen Ancic, so not art historians, see the construction differently. He points to the probability that in the 9th century Zadar, the funds for such a considerable building project could have been raised only with the help of Byzantium. And I will return to it uh, a bit later on. The lack of interest in Byzantine matters in Dalmatia extends even to those cases in which the material evidence points to them. And one such example is the reliquary casket for the head of San, uh, San Oronzo et Zadar. It consists of three complete and one partial uh, silver plate which were mounted later on in the 15th or the 16th century, so put, uh, disassembled and then assembled in a reliquary of a different shape. Um, the plates show 12 saints, all brothers, whose relics were kept in the church of Santa Sofia in Benevento, so in Italy. The names of the saints are written in Greek, but the dedicatory inscription is in Latin and identifies the patron as a local dignitary. Although the casket was recently included in Nikolai Akshit's monograph on the metalwork in Zadar, it was analyzed only stylistically, and the last scholar who contextualized it was Hans Belting in the 1970s. While Akshit attributed the casket to local craftsmen and identified only the saints' costumes as Byzantine, Belting highlighted the casket's dependence on Byzantine models, both in technique and style, and compare the figures to the images of saints in Hosius Lucas. At the same time, he argued that the casket was a product of a Latin artist because the titulae with the saints' names are written in bad Greek and because the Athenthus scroll reminded him of the scrolls which feature on some Islamic ivories from Salerno, so again Italy. Apart from being broader in perspective, Belting's assessment also picks up on the fact that the saints depicted are not found in the Byzantine calendar and that the town of Benevento, as the center of their cult, happens to be the birthplace of Desiderius of Monte Cassino, the abbot of Monte Cassino, who was the most important patron in southern Italy during the late 11th century, whose taste for Byzantine art was recorded by Leo of Ostia. Desiderius sent envoys to Constantinople to hire mosaic makers who came to Monte Cassino. So I'm just showing you a portrait of him presenting a basilica to Christ from a nearby church in Sant'Angelo in Formis, but nothing is preserved in Monte Cassino because of the bombing in the, se the, bombing in the Second World War. And this would have been um, the Benedictine basilica um, built in the 11th century. So for this basilica, he sends people to Constantinople, they bring the mosaic makers, then he has the monks trained by those mosaic makers to make mosaics, but he also has them trained to work with metal, glass, ivory, wood, alabaster, and stone. And he fills the entire basilica with the stuff he got from Constantinople, gold nantependium with gems. Uh, he orders a bronze ivory door because he saw one in Amalfi and he wanted one. So in a way, you didn't have to go to Byzantium. You could also just go to Monte Cassino and come see the whole thing, which I think poses a problem when we talk about um, what Byzantine is, or outside Byzantium, or what Byzantine influence is. Anyway, Belting therefore concluded that the plates could only be made in Monte Cassino for a Greek patron. So by now, it is obvious that Croatian art historical scholarship is missing out on significant connections between Byzantium, southern Italy and Dalmatia in the early Middle Ages, and that by doing so, it undermines the potential for more integrative research approaches to the art and art architecture of the period. So why is this the case? Now, okay. Um, in order to understand this, we have to understand the wider region and Croatia's place in it. 
both geographically and historically. And the crux of the matter is that regardless of how other countries view Croatia, which is most of them see it as a Balkan country, Croatia sees itself as belonging to the West. Byzantium, therefore, is not something it identifies with, even though, this is outside of my topic, but 6th century Byzantium, so Justinian's uh, area and art, was really big in Croatia, and there's material which is fabulous. But, you know, that's before the Croats arrived. <laughs> and, um, yeah, so we don't identify with Byzantium. And the best example for this are the statements made by Croatian Prime Minister Zoran Milanovic in May 2013, in which he used the terms Byzantine and Byzantium in a highly pejorative way. So to him, Byzantine is, is synonymous with conservative and backwater attitudes, corruption and conspiracy. And when the journalist asked him to clarify his metaphors, and he's a trained lawyer, the Prime Minister responded by saying that he was not referring to Justinian's or Constantine's Byzantium, I take it he means Constantine the Great, but to the late one, which was a synonym for intrigue and decay. So that's the poor old paleologans, I think he thinks, are um, intriguing. And I'm giving you the statements, commenting on the sex education, anti-liberal moves, Byzantium. Whoever wants Byzantine ways should go to Byzantium. In other words, read should go to Serbia and so on and on and on. And then comparing it to the Nordic model, not Scandinavian, Nordic, which kind of sounds a bit like, uh, you know, like the um, gone days of uh, the 1940s. Anyway, secondly, what is at stake uh, when discussing about Byzantium is Croatian national identity, which is more frequently than not defined through its relationship with Serbia. The trouble with Byzantium in Croatia lies in the fact that it is equated and associated with Serbia as Croatia's other. While a standard Croatian identikit is that of a Catholic nation which uses the Latin script, Serbia is orthodox and uses the Cyrillic script. And from this um, emerges a chain of assumptions that are made, such as the one which denies any Balkan or Eastern elements in Croatia as opposed to Serbia, which is assigned to the same Eastern, although I suspect this means Orthodox, category as Russia and Greece. To make matters worse, in communist Yugoslavia, the Center for Byzantine Studies was in Belgrade, which only strengthened the perception that Serbia is where Byzantium is. So put together this uh, kind of very simple contrast. Basically you get, uh, like I said, Latin script, the flag, the, the crest, and the Pope, we like him, he's a boss. And his representative is the local cardinal. And then in Serbia, this is the contrast. So everything that's foreign, that's not us. And because there is no pope, they have their own um, metropolitan bishop, which they do talk, but you don't see that a lot in the news, for example. When I Googled it, there's just one photograph and all the others are, you know, um, of them um, separately. Yes, Patriarch, that's right, that's right. Thank you very much. Ireneus, I think. <laughs> Following the breakup of Yugoslavia in 1991, Croatian interest in Byzantine studies dwindled and in the political climate imbued with a narrative which did everything to distance Croatia from its recent past as part of Yugoslavia, seen as just another name for Serbian dominance. The topics which attracted the attention of early medieval art historians were Croatians' relationships with Rome, Carolingian Francia and Hungary. These were accompanied by large-scale exhibitions such as the one in the Vatican about uh, Croats, Christianity and art, and the one at Split, which was about Croats and Carolingians. But what happened when Brescia wanted to display the objects that were on display in Split, all of a sudden they changed their mind and included the Byzantines in the title, although the same objects were in there. And one of the anecdotes is where they asked the director of this museum and said, well, what are you going to do something on Byzantium? And he said, well, I might do, I might do, but what are you going to display? And he said, well, I'm going to display the same things. So basically it shows you that you have the monuments themselves, but it's like what story you want to sell, this is what is, uh, is, being, is being done. So. Um, and just briefly, the avoidance of facing up to Byzantium during the last 23 years of Croatian independence has been compensated by the reintroduction of the term Adrio-Byzantinism as a softer label. This term was originally coined by the Danish archaeologist Einar Digve, 
who excavated in Dalmatia, but also in Thessaloniki in the 1930s, and who used, it to, who used it to refer to the flourishing period of the 5th and 6th centuries in the Adriatic towns such as Salona, Ravenna, Aquileia, Grado, and Porridge. The term was first criticized in Italy, of course, by Geza de Frankovic, who stated that the same phenomenon occurred outside the Adriatic and that it was not useful, and some Croatian scholars agreed with him. But he was defended to say, well, he didn't mean style, he meant the society. And in that way, the term has acquired a new meaning, and now it's applied to medieval trends which show Byzantine influence. So, for example, when Igor Fiskovic analyzes the Romanesque frescoes uh, in the area of Dubrovnik, in Dubrovnik Cathedral, and in one of the small islands around it, he explains stylistic features such as postures or the drapery or the faces and the costume of the archangel as belonging to this Adrio-Byzantine trend. So, having outlined this historiographical framework, I would like to talk about three examples which I have mentioned earlier. The first one is the Holy Trinity Rotunda at Zadar. It was built in two consecutive phases next to the local cathedral at some point between the mid-8th and the mid-9th century. As it is today, the rotunda dominates the square in front of it with a mount bulk and uh, pilaster stripped and openings, some of which were walled up. You can also see the foundations which are exposed and in them you can see the Roman spolia, which is not how it would have been originally. And that is so, not because this is how the building was envisaged originally, but because this is what the fascist government did in the 1930s when they held Zadar. So because they wanted to show Rotunda as more Roman and thus more Italian, action was taken to tear down the annexes which surrounded it on all sides and extend the pilaster strips all the way up so it would resemble a classical freestanding rotunda. At the same time, the original floor was removed in order to ex um, you know, expose the level of the Roman Forum and the Roman spoiler and its foundations. And not just that, because it sits on the Forum, they actually uh, had granite columns shipped from Rome and erected on the Forum at Zadar, and they are still there to have this kind of, this is a Roman town. Now that the church had two building phases was established by uh, its expert, Pavel Shavejic, uh, conservation officer during the conservation works in the 1980s. He discovered the traces of seven stone beams, sorry, which kind of were placed um, above the columns and only one of them um, in situ. The others, he only found the beds in the wall, deeply um, inserted, uh, deeply in the wall, but not here. And he concluded, well, this means that they wanted to make it, it was a single story rotunda, no gallery, columns, and then they changed their mind or something happened. And what they suggested was that, what happened? They said either the builders were unskilled or there was an earthquake and somebody had to come and fix it. Another thing that he discovered were wooden beams in the uh, floor of the gallery. And they had decorated ends and he said they were sticking out under the roof and were decorative and then just kind of used for the floor to fill the floor when the plan was changed. Because they're made of wood and organic material, they could be analyzed. And um, the results of the analysis carried out in Zagreb in the 1970s placed the felling of the oak trees around 710 to 725 and was corrected by the same experts in 2000 to the period of 750 plus or minus 20 years. That would be um, carbon dating. On the other hand, the dendrochronological analysis performed at Cornell University in the 1990s placed the felling to 866. But neither of the two dating methods is infallible, but we do know that the church was completed and functioning by the mid 10th century, where Constantine Porphyrogenitus mentions it in his De Administrando Imperium. Now, Vejic and most of Croatian architectural scholars came up with an interpretation that during the second half of the 8th century, the church was designed as a single story rotunda with eight columns. So that would be the first one. The project may have been deliberately altered or something happened, but anyway, the addition of the gallery was seen as an indication 
of the arrival of a powerful sponsor or of a cash injection, or it was associated with something that they thought relevant, and they sought the source of that um, building campaign in the political circumstances of the time, and they found it in the Carolingian world, where Charlemagne had a monumental rotunda built in Aachen between 790 and 800. And this connection was supported by the Frankish sources, so I'm showing you comparative ground plans between Aachen and Zander. Um, confirmed in the Frankish sources, who say that around Christmas time, the bishop Donatus and a local dux, uh, Paul, came to Charlemagne's court at Diedenhofen and brought gifts to acknowledge his rule over the people of Dalmatia. But they didn't go to Aachen, where the chapel is. They went to Diedenhofen, no, sorry, Aachen, they went to Dienhofen at Thionville, which is 200 kilometers away from Aachen. So how could they have seen the chapel and then copied it and, you know, imitated the model in their own time? This formal analysis has been recently challenged by Croatian historians who attributed the financial backing of such a large building to Byzantium. They do not question Carolingian territorial pretensions, um, but they say that as soon as Byzantium saw that the Carolingians want part of the Adriatic, what they did in 806, they sent an imperial fleet, they sailed in, and Byzantium responded by something that Jonathan Shepard calls the application of soft power. By soft power, he means that uh, local elites in Venice, but also in Dalmatia, were given titles and gifts and provided with hospitality in Constantinople in order to convince them to be subject to the Byzantine Emperor. The gift-giving practice included the donation of relics frequently. And instead, in the early, uh, in the, uh, sorry, and in the early 9th century, Byzantium was really magnanimous when it came to sending the relics to the Adriatic. Now, Venice received the relics of St. Theodore. We are, this is all before St. Mark and St. Zacharias. And uh, um, the Emperor Leo V even sent builders from Constantinople to construct a chapel for these relics next to the Ducal Palace. Then uh, St. Trifon, his relics were sent to Kotor in present-day Montenegro, and Zadar got the relics of St. Anastasia, which is a Syrian martyr who was venerated in uh, Constantinople, but also in Rome. And according to a local tradition, um, a hagiographical legend, they say it's the Bishop Donatus who got the relics from Constantinople and put them in a marble sarcophagus which invokes the Holy Trinity. And so for that reason, some scholars say that the rotunda was built as a sort of a material for the, for the relics. Croatian historians, therefore, have placed this evidence in the context of Byzantine administration in Dalmatia. It can be deduced from the Byzantine tactica, which is lists of Byzantine officials, and the already mentioned lead seals, that a Byzantine governor is responsible for Dalmatia, and that he resided at Zadar in the second half of the 8th and the early 9th century, the time when the rotunda was built. And for this reason, they started to argue that only Byzantium could have and would have backed the construction of such a large and special church. Mladen Ancic stated that Byzantine builders were sent to repair the damaged rotunda and that the addition of the gallery and surrounding annexes imply that the church was not used only by the local bishop but by the Byzantine official too. Drawing on the comparisons with Constantinopolitan two-story 6th century churches such as Sergius and Bacchus and Hagia Sophia, where the gallery was the place from which the emperor or his representative observed the liturgy, Ancic argued that in his second phase the rotunda was designed to honour imperial authority embodied in the person of a local dux. On the other hand, although Vejic acknowledged the association with the gallery and its uh, tribellum, so the triple opening, so there's heavy piers all around and two columns uh, immediately in front of the apse, he was arguing basically that it's not, a, it's not a dux, it's a local vision. None of these interpretations provide a satisfactory explanation of the source model and the reasons for the construction of the first freestanding rotunda. A single-story rotunda with three apses does not reflect Carolingian models. Aachen had one apse of the second half of the 8th century. And even if it did, it would be incompatible with the presence of a Byzantine governor at Zadar in the same period. 
On the other hand, if only the second phase containing the gallery can be linked to the Byzantine policy of soft power, who was then responsible for the freestanding rotunda and who raised enough funds to almost complete it? Taking into account all of the above, and in order to reassess the Holy Trinity for, from a more objective point of view, we have to situate the rotunda in the context of what we know so far. So the carbon dating of oak beams says that the oaks were felled in the late 8th century, so the building starts after that. That means that the freestanding rotunda started to be built after that. At that time, a Byzantine official with the title of Dux resides in Zadar, has his own seal with which he stamps documents and travels to Constantinople. Across the Adriatic, Ravenna is no longer Byzantine, but is Carolingian, and Venice is looming large and surrounded by Carolingians as well. There, of course, the local uh, governor also holds the title of Dux, which is a, a Byzantine military uh, title, which later became the Doge. Um, in 800, to the displeasure of Byzantium, Charlemagne is crowned emperor by the Pope in Rome. And five years later, those uh, governors from Venice and Sada travel across the Alps in the middle of winter to see Charlemagne and ally themselves to his empire. But as soon as the emperor learns of this, he sends a fleet to reclaim the cities and at the same time decides to woo them back by donating relics. I would agree personally with historians that this is the background of the Holy Trinity. Um, I disagree with the opinions which state that the freestanding rotunda was damaged by an earthquake or that it was unstable due to the lack of expertise of local builders. I think more than anything that the fact that the stone beams were only embedded in the wall on one of its sides demonstrates that the first rotunda was nearly finished when the plan suddenly changed. The addition of the gallery and the building of its annexes all round clearly speaks in favour of a change of function or at least an extension of its original function. In its interior, the rotunda has now become more similar to the already mentioned Byzantine gallery churches and their western followers. This, I think, occurred between 810 and 821 when Dalmatia became a Byzantine theme. The elevation of the status of a local leader, especially after the peace treaty of 812, between the Carolingians and the Byzantines, when it was agreed that Dalmatian towns remained under Byzantine jurisdiction, seems to have required the rotunda to have a different function, probably, as Andrzej proposed, that which involved the local governor who may have had a place in the gallery, as it was the case in Byzantium, and even in Aachen, the Charlemagne emulated this ceremonial custom. Now, the next two cases, we are leaving the 9th century, and we are now in the, um, oh, sorry, in the 11th. The next two cases date from the 11th. At this time, Dalmatian towns are surrounded by the Kingdom of Croatia, and Venice kept imposing itself on and off on most of them, except for Dubrovnik, which is the seat of its own theme and has its own strategos. Now, looking at Dubrovnik, some seven kilometers offshore is a small island of Kolochev, and on it the foundation of the church dedicated to St. Michael. This church belongs to the so-called Dalmatian dome type that I'll show you um, earlier, so there would have been a little dome there. Um, and also the sculptural decoration uh, was attributed to Byzantine connections, although they say it's Byzantine inspiration, with which I agree. Um, I'm referring to the chancel screen gable with the figure of St. Michael that I have already mentioned. The archangel is wearing a chlamys and a hiton rather than the more common combination of tunic and pallium, which is the way he is depicted uh, in a local fresco uh, on a neighboring island. And these features, this costume, was actually reserved for Byzantine dignitaries and emperor himself, and from such palatial context, it was quickly adopted in representations of angels already in pre-iconoclastic Byzantine art. The closest parallel to the angel from Kolochev may be found on an ivory panel from Berlin where the angel adopts a similar pose. Now, the story of inscription is completely different. By joining the architrave and the gable, so there's the gable there, and there's just like um, an architrave with um, decoration and with letters, the text has been reconstructed as this in Latin, which has been translated as, I am asking all of you who are looking at this to pray 
for sister and queen. Oops. Sorry. And the way this is done is by interpreting this abbreviation between the words sister and Regina, queen, as an abbreviation for et. And because of that, the scholars started thinking, well, we need to find a queen who's also a sister to royalty, because otherwise why would she be addressed as queen and sister? And one was found. This was Helen, uh, who died in 1095, wife of Zvonimir of Croatia. He's the most famous Croatian king. And the sister of two successive kings of Hungary, Geza I and Ladislaus I. The most zealous advocate of this was Vedran Agdalonga, sorry, who considered the phrase Soror et Regina as being similar to the way Helen was referred to in the written records, for example, as Soros Regis Ladislai in the Chronicon Pictum Vindo Bonensis and as Helena Gloriosissima Regina in the document issued by Zvonimir himself. Dalonga found other indications for this attribution in the overall historical context of the 1070s and 1080s marked by the conflict between the archbishops of Dubrovnik and Split, which, according to her, threatened the papal policy in Croatia and Dalmatia, which was spearheaded by her husband, King Zvonimir, as the ally of Pope Gregory VII. Pope Gregory VII was a big uh, reformist pope. He didn't want the clergy to marry, he wanted everything to be conducted in Latin, and he was extremely keen to reform Dalmatia because by that time, um, Glagolitic, as one version of the script introduced by Constantine and Cyril and Methodius, reached Croatia and liturgy was being said in the Slavic language, and the priests could have beards, and the priests got married, and the reformist pope said, no, no way, we have to stop this, which is basically the beginning of the church, as it is, uh, you know, that tradition of priests not marrying. Anyway, she said that um, the archbishop of Split um, was helping Pope Gregory and Zvonimir, and they, the local abbot helped them as well, and that as a reward, she gave him the territory where he built this land. Her interpretation, however, goes against the geographical and historical context of 11th century Dubrovnik. The town, first of all, did not have a border with Croatia, so it bordered with Travunia and Zakunje, so not with the kingdom of Croatia, which Zvonimir ruled. Among the donations of land and property, which make up the majority of the extant early medieval written sources on Dalmatia and Croatia, there is not a single record of Croatian munificence in relation to the world. In contrast, the sources mention the donations of 11th century rulers of Zahumia and Dukja, because their territories have, are next to each other. So how was it possible for Helen to reward the local abbot by presenting him with a church on the territory of Dubrovnik, so not even the territory of those Slavic principalities? And the key to that solution basically lies in something very simple, and that's the inscription itself, which shows a couple of uh, Beneventum traits. And Beneventum is a script that was used in Italy, especially of the Bari type that was used in Dalmatia. So all the documents were written in the Beneventum script. So what happened here is that this abbreviation is actually a Beneventum shorthand for the word Eius. So basically the inscription says, Sorore Eius Regina, so his sister Regina, which is the name, not sister and queen. So this means that there was somebody else mentioned probably a brother. And moreover, Regina is a local name in Dubrovnik. Atisius of Regina is recorded in the 12th century, and the name continued to be popular in the 13th century. Therefore, far from referring to Queen Helen of Croatia, the inscription at Kolocek referred only to someone's sister called Regina, most likely a local woman. The commission had nothing to do with the diplomatic efforts of the Croatian court, but was a funerary structure set up and decorated by a local dignitary and his sister. And my final example is not from uh, Dalmatia, it's from Croatia, but it's interesting what is done about it, so I kind of decided to include it, so please bear with me for a couple of more minutes. This is the chancel screen gable I've shown you already, which comes from the site of St. Mary at Biskupia near 
Knin. This is the richest and most important of all the early medieval archaeological sites in Croatia. The grave goods found in the burials inside and around the church bear witness to its high status. So the tombs excavated to the south of the church was a cemetery, have Carolingian golden, um, sorry, uh, gilt uh, spurs, Carolingian swords, um, various buckets, buckles, but also coins, Byzantine coins of Constantine V and Leo IV, 751-775, all of which confirm the late 8th or early 9th century date of the burials. Based on the iconographic details of the gable, such as the cross and the veil, um, and the little uh, marks on her cuffs, the posture, but also at the incision, it's very shallow, the relief. It is argued that it was um, that it copied or painted by Zantan icon. Apart from arguing that, uh, that the model was Byzantine, Croatian scholars did not elaborate any further on it. However, the choice of the Virgin Orans and a specific pose with the palms outturned before the chest, rather than the usual position where her hands are, you know, upraised, uh, do not support such a conclusion, but point in the direction of the so-called minor arts. Now, this rarer Oran subtype can be found in seals, processional crosses, pectoral crosses, and items of jewellery. So, there's a processional cross, one of the Byzantine ones, which are in the Musée de Cluny, and then a little enamel on the Romanos chalice, chalice in Venice, where she repeats the same, uh, the same posture. In early medieval Western art, this subtype is unknown, and even the standard type with the arms raised is limited to the depictions of the Assumption of the Virgin in the Ottonian manuscripts of the Reichenau school. When it comes to the theological message associated with the Virgin Orans, it is a very simple and significant one. She is the ultimate intercessor on behalf of the faithful, and it is in this particular act of prayer that, she, that was embodied in her Orant pose. Now, this role was seen as a useful tool, even by the Pope, but this is a Greek Pope, John VII, who decorated his own oratory with the image of the Virgin Orans. And he was associated with Byzantine emperors who put this image on their coins from the late 9th century onwards. An Orant Virgin glistened in the apse of the Church of St. Mary of the Pharos near the Imperial Palace in Constantinople, as we learn from Patriarch Photios, who described her as, and I quote, stretching out her stainless arms on our behalf and winning for the Emperor's safety and exploits over the foes. Given that the Church of Biscupia was built on a royal estate and that the overall iconography of the Virgin Orans on the gable has parallels in 11th century Byzantine coins, seals, and luxury objects associated with imperial and high status patronage, it seems likely that the Croatian patron, perhaps even the king, was emulated in official Byzantine models. But, in a curious twist of fate, this image was rebranded, so to speak, as a Catholic icon by the name of Our Lady of the Great Croatian Christian Covenant in 1975, at the beginning of the International Year of Mary. The then Catholic Episcopate in Yugoslavia chose this gable as a symbol of the restoration of Christian values in what was then communist and therefore uh, non-religious um, or atheistic Croatia, and of the renovation of the loyalty which bound Croatian forefathers to the Church of Rome. And what was meant by forefathers is clear from a string of anniversaries which was celebrated during the next nine years as part of the Great Novena, which is a nine-year-long period of devotion with the aim of obtaining special intercessory graces. And the main jubilees were all connected to the early medieval rulers and their relationship with the Pope. The symbol of all this was the Virgin from Biscupia, where the 11th century uh, Bishop of Croatia had his cathedral. The gable served as a model for a gold and silver image of Our Lady of the Covenant as a votive offering of the entire Croatian nation, and as such it was taken to Rome where John Paul II blessed it in 1979, marking a 1,100 years of Croatian loyalty to the Holy See based on one of the letters that the prince sent to the Pope in, nine, uh, in, sorry, in 879. But the image acquired another layer of meaning at the end of the war in the 1990s. Since Biscupia is located in the area 
which was held by the Serb rebels just here, uh, close to Knin. And because these, uh, this area was taken over by the Croatian forces in 1995 during the Operation Storm, the image now also symbolizes military victory. And as such, it was used as the, um, as the emblem of the military ordinariate of Croatia, which was founded in 1997 by the Vatican. The aim of that is pastoral care of Catholics serving the Croatian army and the police. I hope that these three examples have demonstrated just how much historiographical and historical baggage comes with the monuments themselves and the terms used to assess them. While associating the 9th century rotunda at Zada with Byzantium causes art historians to shake their heads at historians, in the case of Kolochek, Epigraphers look away from the local context of Dubrovnik and search for patrons in the Kingdom of Croatia. Both cases embody what Chris Wickham identified as cultural solipsism, that is the situation where certain debates, and I quote, make most sense only to scholars from one country and sometimes no sense at all outside its borders, if indeed they are known about at all to other scholars, caged inside their own country-specific preoccupations. With regard to the gable with the Virgin, it is ironic that an image so deeply rooted in Byzantine pictorial tradition and chosen by a Croatian king precisely for that reason has become a Catholic icon which embodies the loyalty to the Pope as one of the main constituents of Croatian national identity. Weighed down by such preconceptions, these early medieval monuments can only be set free by true interdisciplinarity where archaeologists talk to art historians and epigraphers to paleographers, and by a dialogue in an international arena, the cultural solipsism does not steal the limelight that belongs to the artworks themselves. Thank you for your patience.